would be challenged, as we sang just a moment ago, to draw closer to you with each and every day that passes. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, and if you look at verse number uh, 27, the Bible says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul here is talking about running the Christian race. And of course, as we've been studying God's views on social issues, everything that we have talked about, uh, whether it is sodomy or whether it is alcohol or it is the topic that we're covering tonight, every one of these things we have covered and we have looked at from the Word of God has been for our edification or our benefit so that we can grow in our faith and we can become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we're going to talk about drugs and tobacco. Now, this sort of goes with what we talked about last Wednesday night, which was alcohol. Uh, real quickly, let me just get into uh, the lesson. The word drug is used in two different ways. To describe, first off, a substance that is used for medicinal purposes. And then second, a substance, often illegal, that causes addiction, habituation, or a marked change in consciousness. Now, someone might say, Preacher, uh, what was the point of defining the word drug? We all understand what a drug is. Uh, we all understand what qualifies as a drug. It's important because just as we talked about last week with the word wine in the Bible, the word wine is used in two ways. One, to talk about unfermented juice, and the other, to talk about fermented or alcoholic drink. And the word drug in our day and age is used in two ways. And so once again, this lesson has been designed so that if someone picks it up, they understand exactly what the Bible is teaching about this subject. Uh, tonight, we understand that a lot of people take medicinal drugs. But there are many drugs out there that are not medicinal, and these drugs are harmful. And these drugs, Christians ought not consume these and ought not be involved in using these drugs. Now, you'll notice in that second definition, it says that these uh, substances that we're referring to tonight are often illegal. But let me say, as our country is changing, many of these things are becoming legal. And in years gone by, people, uh, Christians, used to be able to say, well, I'm against this or I'm against that because it's illegal. And that was the reason that they gave. Uh, back in uh, the early 20th century, uh, many Christians stood against alcohol. Uh, and when they stood against alcohol, they could uh, look at the temperance movement. Uh, or nowadays, we have uh, where people have stood against marijuana and the use of marijuana. And for so long, people would say, or Christians would say, well, it's illegal. And that's the only uh, reasoning that we had or that we used for why we stood against it. Well, now guess what? Alcohol is legal. Uh, guess what? Marijuana is legal. So as a Christian, I can't just say, well, I'm against those things because they're illegal, because they're not anymore. And so when we, the substances we're talking about tonight, many of them are illegal, but many are nowadays legal. And as our country continues to move forward uh, uh, in a secular sense, or as our uh, world continues to digress, and get worse and worse as the Bible talks about, guess what? More of these illegal substances will become legal substances. Second thing, or second definition you hear, you see here is the word narcotic. A narcotic is a substance given in moderation to dull the senses, relieve pain, or induce sleep. Now once again, just like the word uh, drug, the word narcotic has two meanings. Of course you go in to have a procedure done, and sometimes the doctors will use narcotics. We are not against all narcotics, just like we're not against all drugs. Once again, someone might say, well, preacher, I already understand that. But just want to make sure, because when you go in and you, your doctor says, I'm going to give you some narcotics, I want to make sure you don't say, whoa, 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 I'm a Christian. I, I, I don't believe in that. Okay, there's some narcotics that doctors use to help in procedures. But then there's the narcotics that we're going to be dealing with tonight, which are substances subject to restriction, often subject to restriction, whether physiologically addictive or not. 
There are substances out there that are, some of which are physiologically addictive. What does that mean? It means that your body becomes dependent on them, and some are not physio physiologically addictive, but these substances many times are restrictive, and these are the things we're talking about tonight. Now, moving on, let me make a statement tonight. Tobacco and tobacco products, or share a fact with you, tobacco and tobacco products contain the addictive drug or narcotic known as nicotine. I mentioned alcohol a moment ago being uh, legal. I mentioned marijuana now being legal in, in a number of states. And we know also that tobacco and tobacco products are legal. Whether you're talking about chew or snuff or uh, cigarettes, uh, tobacco is legal, but it is still a drug. Now, with that, because it has nicotine in it, it has that addictive narcotic. Now, let me show you how drugs and tobacco, and a lot of times you'll, you'll hear me tonight say drugs and tobacco, but I really should be able to just say the word drugs, and you'll know that I'm talking about a number of different substances. The impact of drugs on our world today has come in many different forms. Uh, first off, between 80,000 and 100,000 children worldwide begin smoking every day. You may not see it here in the United States, but let me tell you, in other countries, poorer countries, it happens all the time. In Ukraine, we saw it when kids got into the youth group, and they came into the youth group at 12, 13 years of age, they were already being tempted, and many of them would, would start smoking at that age. Nearly one-third of all high school students have used drugs. That means if we pulled in uh, a Buhack, uh, the Buhack a senior high class, or, or excuse me, freshman through senior high class, and we uh, numbered them off, every time we got to three, at least one of those three kids would have tried drugs, according to statistics, at some time in their life, by the time they're 18. One-third of all males in the world use tobacco in some form. Worldwide cigarette sales uh, average uh, $15 billion daily and uh, $10 million per minute. Excuse me, not dollars, but actually uh, just numerically. $10 million per minute cigarettes are sold. $10 million per minute. $15 billion a day. So drugs and tobacco are very prevalent in our society. Once again, as a Christian, just like with alcohol, just like with sodomy, just like with abortion, it's my job to know what the Bible says about these things. Not as a pastor, as a Christian. It's my job to know. It's my job to know whether or not they're right or whether they're wrong and why they're right or why they're wrong. So let's go ahead and look at four things real quickly tonight. Number one, Christians are instructed to care for the body that God has given them. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 is actually on the front of your lesson there. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we are instructed to care for the body that God has given to us. Why? Because first off, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're told in this passage of Scripture by Paul, as he's addressing the Corinthians, he says that your body is the temple. When a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ does not come to live with inside them, per se. I know we use that terminology, uh, ask Jesus Christ to come inside you. But literally, the Bible teaches us that God the Father is in heaven. God the Son, Jesus Christ, is sitting on His right hand. And when a person gets saved, the person who comes inside them is God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit comes inside you. And the day you got saved, God the Holy Spirit came inside you to reside or to dwell. Which means He's not leaving. Which means you can't lose your salvation. Amen? But He comes to live inside you, to dwell inside you, and your body now becomes His temple. It's where He dwells. And so as His temple, we need to take care of our body, the body that God has given to us. Psalm 150 and verse number 6, that's on uh, the left margin of the inside page there. Uh, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. You need to take care of the body that God has given to you because every breath that you have 
is God's. And with every breath that God gives to you, He wants you to praise Him, to honor Him, and to glorify Him. In Romans 8.13 we see that Paul says to the Romans, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit be mortified the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We're told that if we mortify or kill the deeds of the body, kill the, the flesh and the desires of the flesh, and live according to the will of God, and live according to the Spirit who lives inside us, then we will live. But if we live after that flesh, we're going to die. Many people are living after the flesh, or living for the flesh, for their fleshly desires. That's why so many people are turning to drugs and alcohol and the things that the world offers as temporal reliefs from the stress and from uh, the hectic society in which we live. But let me say to you tonight that a Christian who does not take care of his body will not have long to serve his Lord. You don't take care of the body that God has given to you, then you are going to cut down on the time that you have on this earth to praise God. I've been around preachers since the time I got saved, really at the age of 16. Uh, my pastor, I, got, I, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior in his office and shortly thereafter surrendered to preach the gospel. And so whenever my preacher went to a special meeting, I went and I, I met a lot of preachers and I've been around a lot of preachers. And one of the problems or one of the golden calves of uh, preachers today is... Well, we can eat what we want, we can do what we want, we can live how we want, and God will bless us. And I've met a lot of preachers that they didn't take time to take care of the body that God had given to them. Now, I'm not talking about, you have to be careful because you don't want to go to one extreme and say, well, I'm not going to care for this body at all, but you don't want to go to the other extreme and care so much for the body that you actually start worshiping the body that God has given to you. The body is the temple, but you want to focus on the spirit first and the body second. That's why Paul said that bodily exercise profiteth little. He didn't say it doesn't profit at all. He just says that it doesn't profit as much as working on the Spirit and working on being the spiritual person that God wants you to be. Nonetheless, a lot of people are out there and they've given in to drugs and alcohol. They've given in to these things. And we find here on our lesson that cigarette smoke contains 200 different poisons, things that poison your body. People who smoke die on an average of 13 to 15 years earlier than those who do not. If a person uh, smokes, they are going to cut down the time that God gives them on this earth. To do what? To praise Him. This statistic's not on here, but you can write this one down if you want. With every cigarette that a person smokes, they are cutting down on 14 minutes of their life. So for every cigarette they smoke, Man, I've seen some people that can smoke them real fast. Just the other day, I was recycling cans, and a guy lit one up, and he had one gone in no time. There went 14 minutes of his life. That's according to doctors and, and these studies that these doctors have done. 14 minutes of his life, gone right there. Look at this. Deaths in America each year. Every year, 2,400 people die from heroin. And we look at heroin, and we say heroin addiction is bad, and we say this is a horrible drug, and it is. 3,300 people die from cocaine. And once again, cocaine, hard substance. We're against it. Uh, we, we know it does damage to the body. But look at tobacco products. 434,000 people every year in America. Half a million people almost die from tobacco products. And yet they're legal. Somehow they're legal and they kill more people than heroin or cocaine every year in our country. Folks, as Christians, we need to see that if we use these things, it's not wise. We're not taking care of the temple that God has given to us. Moving on, not only are we instructed to care for the body that God has given to us because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit, but it's also a testimony of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 16 through 18, you have a portion of that passage written for you on your lesson. Uh, verse number 16 says, Wherefore, henceforth, Excuse me, I have the wrong passage there. I guess it's 1 Corinthians. I put down 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6. You might want to change that on yours. What? Know ye, uh, know ye not that which uh, that he which is joined to an harley is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. 
Nope, I got the wrong passage there too, don't I? All right, let me find it. Maybe I'll just turn to the wrong passage. 2 Corinthians 6. No, that's it. It's 2 Corinthians 6. I apologize. I just looked at it wrong. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with the idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. How is he dwelling in us? Through the person of the Holy Spirit. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He's teaching separation here. Well, we need to be different than the world. Why? Because we are the temple of, we are God's children. This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we have a testimony to uphold. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, the Bible says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Everything that we do in this life, we ought to do to God's honor and God's glory. And then finally, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 16, the Bible says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Paul tells the Corinthians, If you defile this body, if you don't take care of the temple that God has given to you, the temple of the Holy Spirit, then God is going to take that time that he, you have left away. He's going to take that life away from you. Why? Because not only are you the temple of the Holy Spirit, but you're the testimony of the Holy Spirit. People are looking at you and you're saying, I'm a Christian. And the Holy Spirit of God lives inside me. And then you're puffing on a cigarette or you're drinking a beer. And people look at that and it confuses them. Hey, God is distinct. He is holy. And His holiness ought to be distinct in our lives. Christians are supposed to live different than the world, not just like the world. Second principle we see here, or precept we see here, Christians are instructed to have self-control. In 1 Peter chapter number 4, verses 1 through 2, and once again you have uh, verse number 2 there printed for you on your lessons. 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 1 says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. God has saved us, and he does not want us to live according to the lusts of the flesh, but according to the will of God. In other words, he wants us to practice self Control. In 1 Peter chapter number 2, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. He tells them to abstain from fleshly lusts. Once again, exercise self-control. Now this applies in so many different areas, but we're talking about drugs tonight. Drugs are harmful to the body. They deteriorate the temple of God, but also they're addictive. We need to exercise self-control. So many people in the world today who have given themselves over to one form of drug or another have lost self-control. Each year, 35 million people make a concentrated effort to quit smoking. However, less than 7% are successful. That's less than 3.5 million of them are successful in abstaining from smoking for one year. Christians and I, you can do it. You can do it. My dad, when I was growing up, smoked all my life. He, became, he got saved, became a Christian. He continued to smoke. He has since given up smoking. And I, I know that every day it's a battle. He has to uh, stay close to God, but he stopped smoking. 
I know many Christians who have stopped smoking. I remember the president of the Bible college. He was the pastor of the church. He was a green beret. He gave up drinking when he became a Christian. He gave up loose living. He said the hardest thing he gave up was smoking. But he said you can give it up. You can do it. Hey, you could be one of those people that is successful in abstaining. Practice self-control. Someone once said a little stick of tobacco wrapped in paper is stronger than a 200-pound man. Why? Because that little stick of tobacco is controlling that man, and that man is not controlling that tobacco. Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 16. It's written there on your page, uh, the inside page. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do you practice self-control? By yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit of God. If you try to do it on your own, you will not be successful. Once again, I remember growing up, my dad trying everything. He tried the correct. He tried the patch. He tried this, he tried that. It seemed like he would try something and he would be good for a couple days, maybe a couple weeks, and then boom, he fell back into smoking. He'd have a lot of stress at work running these projects, and he'd go back into smoking. What's been the key to his success? What's been the key to so many Christians' success? It's yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. You have to have God's help. He's the one who will give you self-control. Psalm 19 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. You know who wrote those words? David. David said to God, he said, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. He knew he needed God's help. By the way, uh, if you don't have an issue with drugs or alcohol or any of the things we've talked about on Wednesday nights, then whatever ba battle you are facing, whatever your besetting sin, let me encourage you to practice self-control and give God's help. Psalm 119, 133 says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. You can't control yourself unless you surrender yourself to God. According to the Surgeon General, teenagers who smoke are three times more likely to use alcohol, eight times more likely to smoke marijuana, and 22 times more likely to use cocaine. You see, once a person stops practicing self-control in one of these areas, they slide in other areas. It's important that we as Christians practice self-control. Don't let an addiction control you. Thirdly, Christians are instructed to be sober-minded. Titus 2.12 is written there on the uh, margin of your page, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. In 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 13, the Bible says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Later on in the same book, in chapter 4, verse number 7, Peter writes, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. The exhortation is given in these three passages to be sober or to be sober-minded. Now we, under, so we understand sobriety or, or sober-mindedness in the fact of, or, or in the context of alcohol. When someone is drunk, that means that they are being controlled by the alcohol. They are inebriated. When they are sober, it means they can think clearly. To be sober means regular, calm, not under the influence. And Christians are instructed to be sober-minded. Why do we need to be sober-minded? Why do we need to be free from the influence of drugs and alcohol tonight? It's because we are living in the last days, as Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 7. And he said, because the end of all things is at hand, be sober. Be sober-minded. Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your mind on the prize. Remember that you are in a spiritual battle. And that spiritual battle is also a physical battle because remember, we're body, soul, and spirit. Tobacco and drugs adversely affect a person's ability to think clearly, quickly, justly, honestly, principally, and spiritually. 
I have a hard time taking anyone serious who wants to talk to me about God as they're holding a cigarette or a marijuana joint in their hand. Because I know that those things are affecting their thinking. Whether they want to admit it or not, they are. Folks, we need to make sure that we are sober-minded. Did you know that heroin only takes 12 seconds to reach your brain? And cocaine only takes 12 seconds. That's pretty quick. But once again, tobacco is even faster. Eight seconds, and it reaches your brain, and it affects your thinking. We need to make sure we're sober-minded. We are focused as Christians. Remember, we were told uh, by Paul when he was instructing Timothy that we're supposed to endure harness as a good soldier. We are in a spiritual battle. And if we're not careful, we'll get sidetracked by the allurements of the world and by these things like drugs and alcohol, and we'll forget that we are in a spiritual battle for the souls of mankind. And we'll get focused on pleasing ourselves. Being able to down a beer here or smoke a, 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 a cigarette there just to help with the stress. Last time I looked, Jesus, when He was on this earth, said, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. He said, His yoke is easy and His burden is light. We are looking so often as people for something to help us with our stress when we have the greatest a person in the world to go to with our stressful situation, which is God Almighty. Finally, fourth thing, Christians are instructed to be good stewards of their treasure. Turn over there with me, if you would, to Luke chapter number 12. I want you to see this passage. In Luke chapter number 19, we're not going to read that one tonight, but Luke chapter number 19, you have the story of uh, the master who calls his servants, three servants, he gives them talents, he leaves, comes back, he asked, asked them what they did with it. The, the two that uh, used their talents wisely were rewarded. The one that wasn't had his talent taken from him and given to the first servant. Americans spend, spent $80 billion on cigarettes last year. Think about that for a moment. That averages out, or the average smoker, American smoker, spent about $1,200 on cigarettes last year. That's a lot of money, folks. $1,200. What could you do with $1,200? Well, you could probably make uh, at least one mortgage payment. You could probably make two months worth of rent for an apartment, maybe even a house, depending on what size of house you rent. But can I tell you something else you can do with it? You can support two missionaries for the whole year for $50 a month. $50 times 12 is $600 times 2 is $1,200. You can support two missionaries that are doing the work of the Lord on the farm field, reaching people for the cause of Jesus Christ for $1,200 a year, or you can smoke. And folks, $1,200, that's actually probably a modest figure because we know how expensive cigarettes are. By the way, alcohol, same way. Harder drugs, more expensive. More money that's being spent. This is actually the lower end of the total pool. In Luke chapter number 12, look at verse number 16. The Bible tells us here, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. By the way, tonight, whether you realize it or not, you are rich. Amen? Amen. You're rich. Maybe not physically, maybe not monetarily, I should say. But you are rich spiritually because you're saved. You're on your way to heaven. I'd rather be rich spiritually tonight than rich monetarily. I'd rather be rich miller tonight than Donald Trump. No offense to Donald Trump. Uh, he, I know he released the other day that he's worth, what is it, like $8 million, net worth $9 million, uh, gross, all right, counting all of his assets. I don't know if Donald Trump's a Christian tonight or not. As far as I know, he doesn't have a testimony of salvation. If he's not saved, I'd rather be Rich Miller, a pastor, may, uh, that's considered poverty by the government, than be Donald Trump and have $9 billion and die and go to hell. I'd rather be who I am, a rich man in God's eyes. The Bible goes on to say in verse 17, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Wow, this guy sounds like a lot of people. Take down what you have and build something bigger. 
And what's he going to do? He's going to put all of his goods inside these barns. Well, those goods are only going to be good for so long. And then they're going to start decaying. They're going to start going bad. And look at what he says in verse number 19. I will say to my soul, talking to himself. Why? Because he doesn't have anybody that he can talk to. Why? Because he's invested in himself rather than investing in others. Verse 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool. Remember, a fool knows what's right, but doesn't do it. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. In other words, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to give an account of what you have and what you've done with it. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So many people are missing it today in the Christian life because they're rich spiritually. And God is blessing them, giving them time, talent, and treasure, and they're not reinvesting it into the work of the Lord. And oh man, maybe they've got a nice car, they've got a nice house, and once again, there's nothing wrong with having those things, but they have those things because they've sacrificed doing something for God. Once again, it's not, God will bless you. Uh, this past week, uh, we had uh, these people come out from pg e for uh, energy efficiency. Went through our house, and, and I thought they were just coming to help us by putting some weather stripping on the front door because we had a big gap uh, there at the front door. And I thought they were just coming to do that. Man, they, they went through, they replaced all the aerators in our house. They went ahead and replaced all the shower heads for us, put in some light bulbs in one of the bathrooms, some uh, efficient light bulbs. Did a lot more things than I was expecting. We were uh, There was a, a door handle on our garage door going from the inside to the outside. And the inside of the door handle, I just pulled it out because it, uh, it was messing up. And so whenever you shut our door, it wouldn't shut all the way. It bounced back. But I didn't care because it was the garage. And they said, you know what? We've got an extra door handle. We'll put it on for you. I said, praise the Lord, man. They did a lot more than I was expecting them to do. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. And if God blesses you with nice things, praise God for that. But to seek those things instead of doing what God wants you to do with your life. Instead of putting Him first. That's what it's being talked about here. So many people are investing in pleasure and are investing in the, the drugs and the alcohol and the lifestyle of the world that they're missing out on riches in heaven that they can store up. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 talks about this. Lay up your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. We're going to close here, but this actually doesn't have anything to do with drugs and alcohol, but it just has to do with mankind. I, I've never understood, I've always understood thinking that old cars were neat. And, and maybe even owning an old car would, would be neat. But I've never really understood the people that they worship their cars. It could be an old car or it could be a new car. They worship something that if you drive it around in the Midwest long enough during the wintertime, guess what? It's going to rust out. It's just metal. Man, but people will spend every Saturday polishing that metal instead of taking some time to invest in people and invest in the work of God. Here you have a little math equation for you. If a person smoked a pack of cigarettes a day for 20 years, they'll have spent $14,000 in that 20-year time period on cigarettes. Once again, cigarettes is the one that's being thrown out the most because I don't know that there's anyone in here tonight with a heroin addiction or a cocaine addiction, but I know that tobacco, as we've seen in the statistics, that is actually running rampant in our world today. So there's some advice how to quit. I'm just going to read these real quick and we'll close. If you deny or battling, if you know someone who's battling with an addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs, give them this or give them a copy of this. First, admit that it is a sin against your body and against God. Second, confess that it is God's will that you quit. God doesn't want you doing it. Set third, forsake it by making it known publicly. That doesn't mean that you have to come and stand in front of the church and make it known publicly. But maybe you need to tell your spouse. Maybe you need to tell your family. So that way, you get it out there. Hey, I've been doing this. I know this is wrong. I'm going to stop this. Fourth, get rid of it completely and replace it with something else. When you take something out of your life, you have to replace it with something Stay away from those who partake in it. That means don't go where people are going to be using this, where you're going to be uh, tempted by it. Six, ask God to help you each day throughout the day. Once again, as we talked about, you have to have self-control and only God can give you that. Seven, memorize Scripture to help with temptations. You'd be surprised how many times that Scripture 
can come to your mind at the time that you need it because the Holy Spirit brings it to your memory to help you with that temptation. Remember, Jesus was tempted three times and all three times quoted Scripture. Eight, fast one day a week to emphasize your prayer for help. Emphasize to God that you are serious about quitting. Nine, make yourself accountable to someone else. Tell someone else, hey, I want to quit and I want you to ask me about it on a regular basis. Number ten, remain humble no matter how long you are clean. Humility. No matter how long you've been away from that substance, whether it's a day, a week, a year, or ten years, staying humble and realizing that it's by God's grace that you are where you are. Let me encourage you tonight, once again, when people come and ask you, what does the Bible say? What does your church believe? What do you believe? Share with them the precepts that we look at tonight. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Father, I pray that as Christians tonight, we would purpose in our hearts to know more.